All right, I'll just uh, open up in prayer and then we can start. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful opportunity to discuss your word. Thank you that we can um, discuss your language and learn more about you. Father, we ask you be with us through your spirit, reveal to us the depths of who you are, through what you want to teach us tonight. Open our eyes and open our hearts so we can comprehend and understand and help us draw closer to you and refine our relationships with you in the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. All right, so we are on the second letter of the Aleph Bet. Now, this is the second round we're doing it. I had a quick look this week on the previous study on the Bet, and it was fairly long. But I had a lot of rabbit trails uh, discussing numerous things and lay a lot of foundation regarding the Hebrew Aleph Bet. So tonight will be more a flow on from the Aleph. And there's also some learnings that we are going to glean on uh, from the previous letter set um, we're going to use as some foundational truths. And so tonight's slightly different than the previous study on the Bet. And I hope there's a bit more insight. So we're going to continue with the Aleph Bet till we get to the letter Vav. And then we get back on track with this format of um, capturing this. And then we can decide um, if we're going to continue the second lap around the Aleph Bet or are we going to do the Torah portion. So I'll have a discussion with you guys offline. So... What we're going to look at tonight is basically let the bed and all its symbolism. We're also going to see the relationship between the pay and the letter bed, and also the meaning of the number two um, uh, within the letter bed and what it entails in regards to relationships and the concept of duality. Then we're going to look at this phrase in the beginning, which is the Hebrew Bereshit and what that really means. Um, then we're going to look at the creation of the covenant, um, the creation of the letter Bet um, from the letter Aleph, and then the Bet in relation to the house of, of Yahweh, which is basically the tabernacle. Um, then we're going to look at the concept of the house of elevation and how we fit into the tabernacle pattern as part of our re uh, restoration process. So just um, on the basics of the letter bet, so we have the pictograph um, that's kind of interesting symbol, but that's just an uh, old symbolic symbol of a tent. We have the entrance, and basically that is the bedroom chambers area, and this is the front of the house, um, and that's the place of intimacy. So that's basically the, the, the ancient depiction of the letter bet representing a house. And then we have the normal letter bet, like we know um, in, in the text. And it's got the gematria or the number, uh, represent the number two. Now, bet is the second letter of the Aleph bet, but also it is the first letter of the scripture. It's a letter that starts the word Bereshit. And it's in, in the text, it's got an enlarged bet, like the bottom right you can see there. And this bet is what they teach is it's like a mouth opening and all the words is coming from the mouth. Now the letter bet and the letter pay are related in a sense. When you look at the top um, symbolism of the letter bet, you can, uh, of the letter pay, you can see the shadow of, or not the shadow, the highlight of the letter uh, bet inside the letter pay. So that implies that the pay and the bet are linked to one another. Pay represents the mouth, which has to do with words, and that also now is in line with this enlarged bet, which is the mouth that spoke all the words of the Torah. Now, the bet also represents a house, or a household, or a family, and when you look at all the letters flowing from the letter bet from the right to the left, and all the words of the Torah and the Tanakh, 
you, you will see that the bet is on the right hand side that represents the spiritual and all the words are projected towards the physical and for the, are for the benefit of those who live in the realm of the physical. So it's just like breadcrumbs when you want to follow the trail back into the house. You have to follow the trail of all these letters, all these words and all these teachings in order to find your way back into the house. And that's exactly what the symbolism of this enlarged letter bed is pertaining to the mouth and the letter bed. Now, the letter bed is more complex, and it's one of the most complex letters I discovered in this teaching. Um, and it has to do with the foundation of creation. And we know that Yahweh spoke everything into existence, and the letter bed has a part to play with in that whole process. So we're going to look uh, a bit more into detail of that. Now, just to recap from the previous study when we did the Aleph, we touched on the letter bet where we discussed the Aleph that is actually creating the letter bet. And that we saw with the, the depicting of the Aleph, which is a Vav with two Yods. Now, if you take the, the Vav in the middle and you make it a Nun Sufit, which is a large Vav, or an anointed vav, or a mature vav, the two yodes can be like the ten pegs upholding the canvas, and the vav in the middle, or the nun fit in the middle, upholds the structure. And together it creates a space. Now this is the symbolism of the tabernacle, where the tent was constructed through these little support posts with the ten pegs that supports the structure. Now, the structure contained the presence of Yahweh, and the purpose of the tabernacle is that so that Yahweh can dwell in the midst of his people. Now, this tent is actually exactly what the letter bed signifies. Now, also, in saying that, we also learned that the two hands of the Aleph are represented by the letter Hay and the letter Shin. In a previous study, let's quickly jump up. I've got a picture of that here somewhere. There it is. So the Aleph and the two Yods, which mean hand, those two hands depict the two functions of Yahweh's spirit. The first one is the letter He, which has to do with breath. The sound of breath is the letter He. It's also uh, it also means light, and that light pertains to truth. And this breath of life has to do with your nature. So when Yahweh breathed into Adam, he basically created that perfect nature within Adam. And later on, the shin is what is required to anoint, to appoint, and to give authority to someone to be able to perform a task within the context of this tent or this tabernacle to fulfill a purpose. So the anointing is different to your character or to that nature. So the spirit works in both. The spirit gives you the, the concept of being born again. That's the letter H that you need to receive to get that new man risen in you or that new creation, that new nature when the Torah is written on your heart. And then you receive the Shin, which is depicted by Shavuot's tongues of fire or Pentecost where they receive the flames of fire upon the head. And that is the anointing <coughs> that allows the gifts of the Spirit to be divided amongst the people. Now, the hay has to do with the fruit of the Spirit or the way you conduct yourself, which pertains to truth and holiness. So that is the construction of the letter bet and having all the attributes of Yahweh's Spirit through the two yodes the anointed Vav, which depicts the Messiah, um, which is the enlarged or the mature man that is the center of this house. He is the head of the house. And that's what that means to speak, depicts with the bed. Now, when you look at the bed in relation to creation, and we can place the Aleph in the middle of the bed where we make the word Av or Father, originator so the originator or the concept of the one who originated everything is this concept of a house with the two hands creating 
whatever the Vav represents. Now, the, the Vav is number six, and number six depicts the six days of creation and everything that's created in the, within those six days, as well as the crown of creation, which is the Vav that is representing number six and man. So man was the last part of the creation or the crown of creation, and everything that lead, uh, leads up to that is depicted by this letter Vav. So we see that everything originated from the Father or Av through his creation by the hands of his Spirit creating everything. And that is also uh, part of what the letter Bet represents. And then we saw that there's a physical representation or shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. Now the heavenly sanctuary will have the spiritual hands and the nuns of feet. The physical representation is where those two yodes or the hands of Yahweh will change to the hands of man. So we now form part of the body. We now uphold the tent. We now pull the canvas and uphold the structure for the tent to be contained. And together, collectively, we are the body of Messiah and he's still the head. So that's all pertaining to the letter Bet, representing that body of Mashiach or the house of Yahweh. What we also saw is um, that when you have a, a vav in the middle, which is just a human form or a human effort of upholding center, being the center. So if you build the house of Yahweh around a man, even if the man is anointed and he's got abilities, it's only still a man. Everything needs to uh, be built around the Messiah and the concept of the anointed one. Now, if you have the man instead of the Messiah, you have a flat structure who doesn't have a lot of volume or space to contain a full presence. So you'll have a counterfeit or a, a misrepresentation of that house of Yahweh, and his presence won't be able to dwell within the midst of people within that house. Um, what's also interesting is that when you have three valves, it's 666, and that we also just discovered that if the man is center, man is also the nefesh, which represents the beast, and we know that the mark of the beast is triple six. But I just give you an idea of everything that has to do with man-made things, man's um, ideals, or what they want. It's actually following the nefesh or the flesh which is um, dictated by the influence of the beast or the Nahash that sits behind it. Um, then the next slide was, we looked at the word Bereshit and the hidden Aleph. Now the Aleph is the father or Yotei Vafei, because both the Aleph and Yotei Vafei adds up to 26. And 26 is the attribute of a cube, which represents the space that will contain the physical. And that space is basically what the bet represents. But together with the Aleph bet, in, in, with the hidden Aleph, it represents the father that is hidden, but his house is revealed. So there's a portion of the father, because the bet is a portion of, of, of the father, that we can see that give us an idea of what he's like. But the fullness of him is hidden behind. Now the Aleph and the concept of the Aleph is a spiritual concept that's much larger than our comprehension. So he turned it down, in a sense, into a, a, and packed it into a physical representation or a form, which is depicted by this bet, specifically the word Bereshit, which we're going to look at in a moment to give us an idea of what the Father is like. Now, the bet represents the house of Yahweh. It can also represent the house of Elohim, or the household of Yahweh, which includes his council, all his angels, all the living beings, and every power and, and entity that makes part of the spiritual realm that he governs and that he um, reigned over, reigns over, that is what this letter bet also represent. Now, when we look at the uh, letter bet and the construction of the letter bet, um, the bet can be constructed by three valves. So I've got one valve on top, then one valve on the right, and then one valve at the bottom. And those three valves create the shape of this letter bet. 
Uh, three valves add up to 666, which add up to 80, which is also the number for life, or the letter, or the, or the word chai. They add up to the same number. Now, life or chai is what is contained within this house. So when you follow the words that flow from this enlarged bed, and you do these words, you study these words, it will lead you to the entrance of this house, and within this house, you will find life. Now, this life is connected to the spiritual Aleph that is beyond the bed. And that's why this life is called Chai Olam, or eternal life, which is life everlasting. So it's a life that does not end. It's a life outside of time, and that is the life that we will receive as a gift when we enter this house. So the purpose of the bed is to allow us to enter into the house and to access this high olam and also to access the Aleph beyond or to have a relationship or to, to meet the Father and the fullness of the Father that sits behind this house. So um, two uh, words that also add up to 18 that give us a bit more insight. This comes from uh, last year's teaching on the letter bed. Um, the first word is abia where we have Av, Aleph Bet, with Yod Hey, which add up to 18. And that means Yahweh is my father. And that just gives us more confirmation that the father is in the house. And he is my father when I enter his house, and I'm adopted to be part of his household. All of those things are related to the letter Bet. But when you move this Yod, and you move it to the right, uh, to the right and you insert it between the Aleph and the Bet, it makes the word Aiba. Now, Aiba means hatred or enmity. Now, this is when you destroy or separate the concept of the Father. Now, this relates to us in the physical as well. When you destroy the concept or the image of a Father within a family unit, that family will normally end up into hatred, enmity, and it will end up in, in, in divorce. We also see a spiritual shadow of that in the church today where Christianity, some forms of Christianity, re, uh, not reject, but they do not place as much emphasis on the Father as they do on the Son and the Holy Spirit. And if you lose the balance, you are actually creating that enmity, that imbalance that will cause um, uh, the destruction of the truth and it will lead to the destruction of that house. So it's a misinterpretation or misrepresentation of who Yahweh really is. If you take away the concept of the Father and what, um, what the Father stands for. So it's important to always know that the Father is the goal. Yeshua's name is Yahweh is my salvation. So Yeshua points to the Father. He is Yote Vave. And Yeshua's extension of him that leads us to that origin, that father. So that is our goal. And we should not forget that. Now the purpose of the house. What's the purpose of this bet? Now when we look at this letter bet, we can um, spell it out with the letters bet, yod, tough. And we can place them on the menorah pattern. And immediately we see that the bet is on the right. So that means it's spiritual. Yod is in the center. That means it's a very important concept. And it's the goal or the, the essence of this house. And then we get the taf on the left, which has to do with the physical. So the bet that has to do with the spiritual is basically the spiritual house, spiritual household, and everything that pertains to the spirit that is the goal that this house will lead us to. So we enter from the left, so we have access through the tough first, and then we engage into the yod, and the goal is the bet or the house. So this is the place of origin where the father is, and this is the place where we will be transformed or elevated in order to be restored back to the father. Now, the yod in the center, as I said, has to do with the hay and the shin, the two hands of, of the aleph. And they do the work within us in order to reach that goal, that end goal, which is the house. So we need the light of truth. 
and we also need the light of the fire. Those are the two attributes of those two letters, and both have a shared function, which is light. Um, the light of the fire is the energy or the power, and the light of the truth is the uh, insight or the understanding and the wisdom that we need to understand. So we need the power of the Spirit and also the revelation of the Spirit that reveals the truth to us that is the, are the two hands that work in our lives in order to enter into this house. Now the letter Shin, which is the fire, is also the Spirit that moved over the waters, that changed the Mayim to Shamayim, that elevated the water into a higher dimension or higher realm. That is also a picture for us how we can be elevated is only through the power of the spirit which is depicted by the shin and that whole process will also help you to walk in holiness which has to do with the letter hay and the light of the truth that will lead our way and our path and they will lead us to the house now the letter tough is on the left that means it's physical tough also means yoke and a yoke is something that you put on an ox in order to perform work. Now, within this bait or within this house, it's not a house of passivity. It's a house where there's actions. It's a house where things need to happen for the, for the work to, 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 to um, continue for the benefit of the kingdom to lead people into the house. That's a function of the tough. Now, what we learned previously is that the yoke doesn't mean anything unless you put it on top of an ox. Now, if you connect the aleph with a ox or a um, uh, the aleph and the ox with a yoke or the tough, you get the concept of aleph tough, which is the Messiah, who is the one that performed the initial work in the, the process of creation. So he was present at the creation. Looking at the word bait or bereshit, where the last letter is the tough and the hidden aleph is the first letter, and both perform work. So he was present even within that first concept called bereshit. Now, this is a, 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 something I thought about this morning, trying to think about the, the, the concept of bereshit. Now, when I meditated on this first verse in Genesis 1, verse 1, I realized that the word Bereshit existed before bara. Bara is the act of creation. So Bereshit existed before creation. And what is contained within Bereshit is the preparation prior to creation. That, that something that needs to happen to make the creation possible. Now the only practical way to picture this for us to understand is if we can think about the concept of an artist, where artists have to um, prepare everything. You need to set up his canvas on, on, on the easel, on the, on the stand. You need to get his brushes, mix his paint, put everything together. And then you need to think about what I'm going to paint, what medium, what image do I want to portray. I'm going to do a self-portrait. I'm going to paint nature. What I'm going to do. And then, and only then, you can do the first brush stroke, which is the bara, the creation process. Now, when we look at this whole process of the creation in relation to Yahweh, we can actually see that the whole of creation is a self-portrait of Yahweh. And everything that is created is to reveal Him to us. Because the artist must also think of the audience, the people who will look at this picture, what message do he want to portray to the, to the viewer? What does he want to stimulate within them? And if it's a self-portrait, he wants to reveal himself to the audience, and then they, when they look upon it, they will see something and understand the artist that's behind this creation. So in the same way, Yahweh created this abstract creative piece of work, which is the creation. And when we look at every single aspect of it, we see him in it. And because he's so complex, his creation is very complex. So for us to understand him, we need to study his creation and study every single word that came from his mouth in order to understand him. 
The other thing I want to just highlight here is that he is the hidden Aleph behind. The hidden Aleph is something greater than we can comprehend because we are limited in our understanding and reference points within the physical to try and understand the greatness of something or someone that is in the spiritual. Now, later on in the study, I'm going to just bend your mind a bit, just comparing two concepts with each other. And thinking upon these two things will drive you crazy if you really uh, meditate on it. Now, that is trying to understand Yahweh is mind-bending in order to, to, to get a small grasp of him. But he gave us the medium of the physical and the medium of everything that's created to reveal a small portion of himself so we can get an idea of who he is and what he is. So that's the purpose of his creation, and it's all to do with this concept called Parashit. Now, in the beginning was a thing. Now, the word bait, which is bet yot aleph. Now, I've got it highlighted in orange. There you can see the word bait. And in the middle, in the blue, you'll see the word rosh. Now, rosh means head or leader. And it can also imply the meaning king. So, inside the word bereshit, we have a house, which is bet. And we have a leader or a king which is inside of this house and with the enlarged mouth and the pay connected to the, the bed, the king is speaking and creating from this house. So he is present within this first stage, setting the background of his creation. And that is where the authority figure or the mind, the mind behind everything exists. And this is a lower representation of the true Aleph. So this king in the house is not the larger representation which is contained in the spiritual, which is the Aleph. It's a lower physical-like representation of the Aleph. And we're going to look a bit later on what that means. So within Bereshit, we see this, this whole uh, uh, concept of preparation or stage prior to um, creating. Now, Bereshit means in the beginning. And when I meditated on in the beginning, it can mean it implies time. There's a time that started. It can also mean in the beginning of a space or a surface. There's an edge that's a starting point, and that's the beginning point where you explore the surface from. It can also mean beginning of life. It can also be the beginning or starting point leading to a destination. So looking at all the concepts regarding beginning, it gives us the idea of our physical world. Everything that we know has a beginning. And having the concept of the beginning implies that there is an end. Otherwise, you wouldn't have said in the beginning. So everything that has a beginning has an end. And everything, time, space, surface, life, and a destination has an end, which re may result into the end of time. It can result in um, a surface ending or a destination reached or a life that ends into death. So that is our world of extremes and the concept of duality start now to form. Now duality is linked to the number two, which is also the number of bet, uh, which is the second letter. Now the beginning and the end or life and death or starting point and destination is basically the opposites or the extremes of a concept that originated from one idea initially but they were separated. Now we're going to look at the word para and the meaning of para and you'll see the concept of separation within that creation process. So what I want to uh, give you the idea is that the word bereshit, specifically the bet, is the place and the starting point where the creator thought about these concepts. Before he spoke, he thought about time, he thought about space, he thought about life, he thought about death. He 
created all these concepts prior to speaking the first word, prior to putting the first brush stroke on the canvas, so to speak. Now, having a beginning, which we know is the Aleph, if we look at the, the picture of a better sheet with a hidden Aleph, there is an end, which we also see within the Taf of this word better sheet. And that beginning and end, or the Aleph and the Taf, is also the concept of duality, of something that is separated, that was once one, that now exists in a lower realm of duality that has a specific function. So what I can say here is the first idea of Mashiach, that he exists in a lower realm, he's a lower manifestation of the Aleph, so we can grasp a concept of who the unseen God is, but he has a beginning and an end to, to fit within this world of duality. So he was born, he received life, and he died, and he uh, manifested the tough. So he himself had to manifest his form within this world of duality in order to fulfill his purpose within this lower realm as part of these concepts that were created prior to creation within the word Bereshit. Now, looking at the word Bereshit, bara, the two um, uh, uh, words, first words, we see that the word bara is also contained within Bereshit, within the first three letters, as highlighted in the orange um, circles there. So that gives us the idea that there were two creation processes. The first one was the prior creation of the ideas and the concepts and how the things will interact and, and work within the world of duality and, and all of that is planned, if you like. And then the second bara is the physical manifestation and speaking of those things by the entity called Elohim through the, the lower manifestation of the Aleph, called the Aleph Tav, which is Mashiach, and two things were created through that whole process. So we have a pre-creation stage, we've got a physical creation with the help of the Elohim through the one called Mashiach, and two things came into being. Now those two things that came into being can be represented by two kingdoms, a one lower kingdom, which is Erex, or the physical, and one higher kingdom, which is Shamahim, uh, the heavenlies. Now, Shamahim is ruled by the king of the host of heaven, heaven, which is basically Yahweh and his council. The lower uh, Erex is ruled by Adam. But when Adam fell, he gave the authority to the Nachash, who is currently still the ruler of Eretz, which is the lower physical realm in which we find ourselves in. So the two creative words, bara, repeated twice, also confirms the two uh, uh, kingdoms, if you like, or two spaces that were created within creation, one higher and one lower realm, but those two are connected. And we're going to... Uh, look at that mind-bending concept of connecting the spiritual and the physical. Now, the number two, as I said, has to do with duality, but it's also a paradoxal concept. Now, the paradox come into when you connect Eretz and Shamahim, the two, which is the physical and the spiritual, in a sense. Now, just to give an idea of the mind bending or the paradox of these two concepts, when we, we live in the physical, so we know that we are in a space that is static. So we have a foundation of the earth, everything stands still from our point of view, and time is the thing that is moving. So time goes by, and that's why we have a beginning and an end. We, we are born and then we die because of time. So we are subject under the realm of time that is moving. But we exist in a space that is static, that is called Eretz. Now, Shamahim, on the other hand, has got the opposite attributes, where time does not exist. That's a realm beyond time. So Shamahim is not subject to time. 
There's no beginning and end. So in that way, you can say that time is static, but in, in saying that, then space that is infinite, you can make the assumption that space is moving. That means that there's no end point to space, but time stands still. Now, when you connect these two, that's where your mind doesn't want to function anymore when you think about these things. Because when you look from a physical perspective to the spiritual, where there's no time, that means that whatever happens, happens so fast, before there's one second going from one to another, there can be multiple things happening in the spiritual, and we perceive it as one second or one day. And in saying that, when we read the scripture that Yahweh created um, something in a, a time frame of a day, from a spiritual point of view, it could be a thousand years or a million years because time does not exist from Yahweh's point of view. And when we um, uh, uh, are in the physical and we, for example, freeze this time, that means that anything in the spiritual can move around us and do things without us noticing it. And when we release that time again and we get the moving time, then there's something totally different. Something miraculous happened. A big shift happened or there was something miraculously created. But that split second could be a thousand years. So what I'm trying to say is that the spiritual realm, in effect, move faster than the physical realm. The spiritual realm move faster from our perspective because they can do a lot of things in a split second because our time stands still from, from their point of view. And from our point of view, space is infinite. So there's no end to the universe when we look at, uh, at the concept of the spiritual. And Yahweh does not have a beginning or an end. He's infinite, and that's where that concept comes from. So this paradox and these two concepts, the Eretz and Shamahim, were once one within the Aleph, within the mind of Yahweh. And he separated the two extremes of these paradox, of the infinite space and static time and static space and, and, and moving time, and he connected the two. And within the one, he created the physical creation of duality. And now you might ask, why did he bother separating something where he is and making something different that is connected but so much different to, to, to what, where he is? Why did he bother going through all of that? Now, the, the reason for that is, let me just find the slide. I've jumped a bit. Um, the reason for creation. So for us to be created um, in the image of Yahweh means that we need free will. We need to have free will because Yahweh's got free will. Now, if there's free will, it means that you need to have a choice that will give you a free choice to choose whatever you like to choose. Now, for free choice to exist, you need to have two opposing things to choose from. And for two opposing things to exist, you need to create a world of duality full of choices in order to stimulate man or Adam within the realm where he can exercise his free will. Now, the reason for free will is for love to exist. Because if you don't have love, you are a robot or you are programmed to worship him. But if you have free will and you love him out of choice, it means that it's spontaneous and that love is then pure. So for the reason of having love, he needed to have free will for free will. You need choice for choice. You need two opposing things of the same idea. And that is the idea of duality. And that's what the letter bet is about. So our whole physical realm and creation is created for us to exercise this free will to get this concept of love embedded within us. Now, within this world of duality, there are many things that are opposing. So when Yahweh said, let there be light, then he said the next, 
He separated the darkness from the light. So he separated the same thing into two opposing things. The one is not like the other, but they came from the same. So that's where you get the idea of light and darkness, hot and cold, north and south, positive and negative, good and evil, man and woman, beginning and end, life and death. And all those concepts existed within the pre-planning phase of Bereshit in the beginning. And all of that exists because Yahweh wanted to create a man that has free will. And then he spoke the first word through the Aleph Taf, through the act of Barath, through the help of Elohim, and he created the six days of which the crown of creation was man. And man is now having the ability of having the strongest force that exists between the two opposites. Because within every single opposite, hot and cold, light, um, darkness, north, south, there exists a field, and that field stimulates life. And without the field, life cannot be sustained. And the strongest field that exists between two opposites is the opposite between man and woman, which is love, and also between man and God, which is also love. And that field now needs to be stimulated and built through this world of duality. And that is the reason why Yahweh created the concept of the bed, concept of duality, get the concept of this force field of love out there so he can attract man towards himself and have a relationship with him. All right, great creation and the creator. So, bara, as you can see, um, we have two baras, but bara contains the word bar and an aleph connected to it. So, bar means sun. But before we go into the, uh, the, the meaning of, of, of sun, just quickly, the meaning of bara means to create, to cut down, to select, and to dispatch. Now, that sounds just like a production plant, a production line, where you create something, you cut it down, or you separate it, you select the pieces, and you dispatch one, and you dispatch the other into the two opposites of duality to create this life force within the world of duality. And that para process, um, had to play out with every single aspect of our physical world. Science and everything is supported by this concept of bara or this uh, production line where Yahweh created everything. Now, bara comes from the root word re'e, if you add an hay. And that hay is the insight and the truth or the vision to see something. So Yahweh had a plan in his mind to create something. So his insight went into his action which is bara and he created this world of duality and within this world of duality he sustained life and he sustained love to create man to attract back to himself to have a relationship with now bara um, contains the word bar betresh that means sun and the sun is the concept of the one that proceeds and came from the originator or the of or the father so the son and the father is connected in a sense because the one comes from the other now when you look at bara you see that bara has got an aleph added to it on the left so we have the son connected to an aleph and when you read this you can read it as the son of the aleph or the son of yahweh and the other picture we see here is that the bar receive the two hands and the vav. So it is the sun and the hands of the sun that formed everything from day one to day six. So who is the creator? It's Mashiach. He is the creator. But he is connected to the mind behind the creation, which is the Eden Aleph, which is the father connected to the bed, which is the space which is the father or the originator. So the son is an outflow of the father, but it's through the son that everything was created. Now what we learned previously are, uh, is that the two yods represent the spirit of Yahweh. So the son in, in connection with the spirit is what the creator represents with the mind of the father uh, sitting behind this whole creation process. 
So the three concepts are connected, but they all originate from the Aleph, which is the unseen God. Now the sun um, and the concept of Mashiach means the anointed one. And what we learn from the Shin that anoints is that it gives ability. It also gives power and authority. So the Mashiach was anointed to become a creator. And not only that, he's also the anointed one to recreate or to restore. So only through him, the fallen creation can be restored to his unique original um, uh, blueprint model. So that's why the work of Messiah is the only means to restore man back unto Yahweh and to complete this restoration process so that we can access the house, access the Father, and having the goal of the creation, which is to meet the Father. Now, the phrase um, Bereshit bara is, is written here in Hebrew. I just separated the Aleph from bara. And if you read this phrase, Bereshit says, in the beginning was the son of the Aleph, or was the son of Yahweh. So this means that the son existed in the time frame of the planning process. He was there. He also exists in the first act of creation, the bara, the separation, um, the, the, the selection and the dispatch of every single thing that was created. And everything was created between the hands, his hands, which is the picture by the spirit. So he is the creator that existed before time. And that's exactly what John explained to us in the New Testament as well. So the concept of the sun, which is bar, means sun, beloved, offspring, seed, like in grain, pure and clean. So everything the sun does is perfect. And not only that, if something is defiled or not cleansed, that means cleansing, he is the only one who can make it pure and clean again. The other thing we learn from the sun is that it is associated with seed. And seed is linked to or connected to the plant. And it's the plant that gives life to the seed. And it's the seed that gives future to that plant and what the plant is about to reproduce that concept of the plant or to create something in the image of the plant. So it's only the seed or the sun that can create something in the image of the father or the image of Yahweh. And that's what we also see here. Um, the sun is also a manifestation in the space called Bet. Now, Bet is the lower realm, the realm of duality. And the sun came down in a lower manifestation of the Aleph. So he is Yahweh, but he is lower in a sense for us to understand him. He's not lower in authority or lower in power, yet he is subject to the Father because from another uh, uh, representation, Father is the mind, the Mashiach is the arm, and the Spirit is the hand. And it's the mind that moves the arm and the hand. So the mind has the ultimate authority of the vision, the re'e, and the Son is the one who makes it happen with the power of the Spirit or the Shin, which anoint him and give him the authority and the ability and uh, uh, the means to, to, to create. So the sun is a downscaled representation of the unseen God so that we can have a grasp of what the unseen God is like. Yeshua said, when you see me, you see the Father. And the only way to know what the Father is like is to look and to study the Mashiach because he is Yahweh incarnated in a lower form for our benefit, not in a lower form to grade him, but for our benefit through grace. Um, Yahweh basically show, slowed him down. If he existed in a higher frequency in the unseen realm, his frequency was slowed down so it become visible in our realm, and now we can see him. In that sense, he is lower. It's just a lower medium representation of the unseen God um, that is the Father that we want to be. 
So the whole concept of the bed is to house and to manifest the sun and also to, for us to exist, for us to experience duality, for us to, to live in this world of duality within the field of these opposites so we can have free will and love so we can be created in the image and likeness of Yahweh. So the house and the family bait. Um, bait is, uh, it's got the meaning house, and it comes from the root word bana. Bana means to build, to create, to make, to repair, to bear children, and to generate an offspring. So we can see here that the house has also to do with the creation process. It is embedded within the house. It's not separate. So bara actually comes from bait. Uh, bait is the one that created uh, bara, and it's the aleph that created the bait uh, from the previous study. So we can see the one flow into the other. And because of this bait, bana exists, and because bana exists, bara exists, and because bara exists, the bar exists, and the hands and the, and the arms now uh, flow through and create everything, repair everything, their children, and generate offspring. So we are the offspring of the son, and the son is the offspring of the father. So it's the one seed to another seed to, a, to, to another seed, all in a scaled down representation. So we are the lowest form of the manifestation of the Aleph in a physical blood and flesh form. The Mashiach has got a hybrid body, so to speak. He can manifest in the flesh, but he's also a spiritual being. So he's in the middle. And then you have the Father, who is totally beyond our comprehension in the spiritual realm, where time stands still and space moves. So that's uh, the idea of connecting the two realms and the lower manifestation of the Aleph into our physical realm. In, in, in saying that, we know that there are people who exist who are normal men. If we look at Moses, if we look at Abraham, if we look at David, um, uh, those people, when you study them, you see the Aleph as well manifested in them. But they are a yet lower form than the Mashiach. But they also play attributes of the Aleph within them. So we're all connected with the Aleph through the Mashiach, um, back through the house. And, and Yahweh just wants to restore this connection and give us that revelation that we're in, that he is the originator. Everything originates from him. And at the end, everything will be connected back to him. But we will be an entity or a, a personality or a presence or a conscience that will have the ability to love him because we went through the processes of the bed within the Parashit concept of duality to experience and having the ability to love. Yeah, so Letty says, Yeshua showed us how to be like the Father and we need to, to strive to be like him. So if we imitate the Son, we eventually imitate the Father as well. So it's connecting back up through our actions. Now, Bana is first found in the scripts in Genesis 2, verse 22, where Yahweh created Eve from Adam's rib. Now, that word rib is tela, um, that means side, implying half. So basically, Adam was separated in half and he became Adam and Eve, or Adam and Chava. And so if you take Adam and Chava and you put them together again, you get Adam. So that putting back together is what we call the marriage covenant. When you separate them, you create the two that now can have a relationship you put them together through marriage covenant. You have an intimate relationship. So in the same way, Yahweh separated Adam from himself. And now we can have a relationship with him with the lower representation of the Aleph, which is the groom or the Mashiach. And now we can be through a marriage covenant connected back to him to the marriage of the bride with Messiah. And that connection is the covenant connection that gives us that intimate relationship, that love, uh, love re uh, relationship. So in saying that, is that is one of the goals of the creation, is to have an intimate relationship with him. And that's also one of the meanings of the number two, is the restoration of relationships. So we have the ability to have an intimacy because we have the ability to love because we exist. 
and we're creating the world reality that stimulates the concept of love. And now we can have that marriage covenant, that intimacy back with him and fulfilling the purpose and the goal of creation. Um, now, looking at the, the word salah or sight, um, when we look at the root word for tela, it's the word tala that means to limp or to be lame. Now, this is a very interesting concept. So, when you have a young man and a young woman, and they are alone and they're not married, it's like someone that's crippled. They've got a limp or they can't walk. They can't fully function, so to speak. Now, the best representation of that is if you take Adam, you cut him in half, and you just set, separate the one half. Now, he's got one arm, one leg, one eye, one ear, and he's hopping along, and he can't really do much. Unless you connect him back to his other half, now he's a full man again, as uh, Yahweh intended him. And that's what the marriage between man and woman is about. So if someone does not connect through a covenant relationship with someone else, he's like an imperfect man or a cripple or someone that's lame that can't fulfill the fullness of what Yahweh's calling is upon their lives. In saying that, any non-covenantal relationship, like any... Um, the relationship between a man and a man or a woman and woman that they try to forge this marriage covenant between two things that are not opposing. You can't get the same effect and you end up with two crippled people hopping alongside each other. It's like two lame men eat with a crutch and they keep on limping together. And what we read in the New Testament is that there's healing for those people. Um, the disciples raised one of the crippled men begging for, for money. So there's healing for these crippled people that are in the world that doesn't have the understanding of what the concept of the true creation of the marriage covenant is all about. So we need to pray for those people who are confused, hopping along on one leg, wheelchair, thinking that they um, do the right thing, but they've got no idea. So keep on praying for us as well, those who understand our situation. Um, the tabernacle, the house of elevation. Now I've depicted the tabernacle here with three um, areas or three stages, and each depicting by a letter bed. Now what we learned from the letter bed is that there's something happening within the bed. It gives us access to something beyond that is invisible, something that's greater than we currently understand. So each one of these phases lead to the next phase that's higher than the previous one until we get the ultimate or highest phase um, uh, depicted by the three stages of the tabernacle. So the first entry point of the tabernacle is to enter from the kingdom of darkness or Eretz, the lower form where Adam or man is, the fallen Adam. So when we enter, there's the elevation process that takes place. Uh, the brazen altar and the labor, which is the shin and the mayim, and we get the shamayim, which is the connection to the higher dimension. It's the first elevation that takes place. That's where that hay works in you, the spirit reborn you. You get the regeneration power of the truth inside of you, the gospel message, and your eyes open up and you see the bigger plan, and you work with Yahweh now. Now, the spirit works within you and that first elevation takes place that gives you access to the intimate relationship now having that revelation you get into contact with the 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 aspect of the spirit the anointing of the spirit the tongues of fire upon the head the dividing of the gifts upon the spirit and that's what the menorah is all about that spirit that anointing that sit upon the heads each one having a different ability but coming together as a body within the house of Yahweh, representing the fullness of Mashiach. But he is that moon to feed the centerpiece that upholds the tent that allows the presence. And being in a holy place is the place where only you go in. You can't piggyback on someone else's relationship. You need to have an intimate relationship. And you have that through engaging in the gifts of the Spirit, the anointing, the authority and the ability, walking in it and exercising that. You also have the showbread, which is the word, studying the word, learning the word, walking the word, 
making the word part of you, following the breadcrumbs back to the entrance of the enlargement to access the Aleph. And that whole intimate process will elevate you. And the way you express that is also through your personal relationship now with, with Yahweh through his son, Yeshua, the lower manifestation of the unseen God. And that is through the golden altar of incense, which is prayer, communication, having a relationship with another person that is currently not seen, but who lives within you, presence is within you, because you are in the holy place. You represent the holy place and a part of that holy place, and his spirit dwells within you. Now that elevates you to the next level, which enter you into the last stage, which is the final elevation that gives you access to the presence of the Father. And that's the restored man, the true Adam. You want to access Shamahim, and you are now elevated to that higher level where time stands still, where space moves, where Yahweh is. That paradoxical area that is connected to the physical, but it's not. But it relates to everything. And you now can flow to that. So people access that through death. You will also access that through uh, the resurrection, or you can access that through um, the gathering, being alive, when he will gather you to be part of the wedding feast. And that's where that marriage covenant will be fulfilled. The final stage, I'm going to slide here, which I skipped. Where the final covenant will happen, which are Shavuot is the first stage, the, the uh, receiving of the commandments. And the second stage is Yom Teruah, where the bride will be gathered and be made one. And that is where the fullness of Adam will happen, where humanity will connect to uh, Mashiach uh, in that personal covenant relationship with the Almighty. Now, the three stages, as I said, the outer court is where we access from the place of darkness. And the first object you face is the brazen altar, which is the blood of the Lamb, which is depicted by the first festival, which is Passover, which is the Feast of the Covenant. That first engaging of the covenant of Sinai, Shavuot, that's the connection to the Passover lamb, because that was the first thing they uh, accessed after leaving Egypt with the Passover. They accessed the mountain and received the commandments. The next one is the holy place, the personal relationship, where you learn to have a relationship with him, engaging with other people, sharing the gifts of the Spirit, supporting one another, loving one another, exercising that. And then the final one is the Holy of Holies, the final eleva elevation and the restoration back to the Av, the Aleph Bet, the Father. Um, so this house of Yahweh, the Bait, uh, is connecting the lower realm with the higher realm. This is the means or the channel or the portal, whatever you want to call it, that allows our physical bodies to, to be transposed into a physical, spiritual hybrid, just like Yeshua is, a lower manifestation, but yet higher than we are now, to connect to the one that is even higher. So once we're in that stage and state, then our eyes will see, and then we'll have a better understanding and revelation of who he is. But until then, we have a limited understanding, and we must study his creation and his work. Now, this final goal of his plan is revealed to Abraham in Genesis 15, verse 1, where he said, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. So he is our reward. He is our goal. That should be your goal and your motive for serving him, not to get something from him, not to get your debt canceled, not to get money, not to be looked after, not to be healed. Whatever your motive or your need is, he's not there to fill your gaps. You get him. The blessing of his walking with him, there are benefits like healing, provision, and all of that. That's a side benefit. That's not the goal. You will get that anyway when you focus on the end goal, which is Yahweh. All the other things will fall in place. Um, so just remember that. Don't look at the hand. Worship the hand because the hand holds all the things that you need. Look at the face. Worship the person. And the hand will provide to you anyway what you need, filling your gaps. Um, the next slide is 
your relationship in relation to the camps. Now, when Israel camped, as they travel through the wilderness, they camp in five different locations. So the first camp is in the center. That's for the priests and the Levites. And then there were four camps around that, as depicted by the, the image. Um, so one of the camps that were linked directly to the tabernacle's entrance were Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. They were the ones who faced the priests and Moses and also could see the entrance of the tabernacle. So they represent people who have a greater understanding of the things of Yahweh. So the reason I'm saying that is that the camps represent different ways of understanding Yahweh, worshipping Yahweh, and walking in, in, in a revelation that you receive from him. Now, the people that are facing to the north, for example, they only see the side of the tabernacle. When you look at the people uh, uh, camping at the south, they see the other side of the tabernacle. So their relation or relationship towards the presence or towards Yahweh is different. Now, all these people were one house, one household called Israel. But they all had a different relation or relationship towards the house or the presence or towards Yahweh. One is not wrong and the other one is right. It's just different. And Yahweh chose it to be like that. That's why we are not to judge other uh, people who try to serve Yahweh. Even if they have the day wrong, they worship on a Sunday, or they don't do all the festivals, because they don't have the revelation that Judah had looking inside the tabernacle, and having all the revelation um, to the exposure. Now, this is similar to the, the parable of the talents. The ones who received five talents are typically the ones who camped at the east. They could see everything in the tabernacle. They've got revelation. Number five is the Torah. They knew the Torah. They knew they had to do the commandments, the festivals, and all of that. And then there were other people who received two talents. They are typically the people on the sides. They only had a limited understanding, but they had slightly more than the people facing the back of the tabernacle. Now, if you are faithful in the little bit of revelation you receive, whether you receive little or much, or just enough to get you in the gate, you still have a relationship with Yahweh in some way, shape, or form. And if you are faithful in what you believe, it will be counted to you as righteousness. Because Yahweh is righteous, he will not judge you unless he revealed something to you and want you to walk in it. Which brings me to the next slide. Now, what we also see in the same picture is that Moses, Moses' brother Levi, Aaron, he had uh, 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 three sons, the Levites, and they formed three groups, Merari, Gershon, and Koath. Now, each one of these had a different job to do in relation to setting up the camp, specifically the tabernacle, setting it up, and when they uh, leave again, they have to pack it up and carry it to the next location and, and set it up again. So they had the task that is a higher calling than the ones just camping around it. So these ones only interacted with the tabernacle once they set up and then there's offerings or whatever. But these people had more interaction, more responsibility than the people in the camps. Now, within the three of these, there were different kinds of interaction as well. Marari was responsible for moving all the support structures and carrying all of that. Now, they used ox wagons when they uh, moved and relocated the support structures. Gershon had the responsibility of setting up and moving all the coverings of the tabernacle. They also packed it onto ox wagons, and then they moved it. Boaz was the only group that were responsible for physically carrying all the artifacts, including the Ark of the Covenant, on their shoulders. Now, when you think about it, when you travel through the wilderness and you have to carry, for example, the Ark of the Covenant, 
there were four people who had to watch their walk, watch how every single step they take. Because if one of the four have a misstep and step into a hole, the other three can be pulled down and they all four can stumble. That's why certain people within the body have a higher calling of walking in holiness. They've got a greater responsibility because they can cause others to fall. Then you have people who only have, like, for example, once a week. They set up, they facilitate the worship, and then they pack up again, and then people go home. And then you get the people in the camp. They've got the least uh, responsibility. They just need to uh, uh, rock up there and then take part in, in, in whatever is facilitated, and then they go home. They don't have any work that they do physically to facilitate uh, the worship. So in saying that, those who have a higher calling, carrying everything and living in a higher state of holiness, should not judge those who are only attending. And those attending should not beat themselves up for not walking as holy as the ones who have the higher calling. And Yahweh is the one who decides who is doing which task. So we should not judge one another. We should uh, allow one another to do the function which Yahweh called you to do, not to be jealous, not wanting to do something greater. We must be careful how we look and relate to one another, not expecting more than people uh, than they should, or not wanting something that someone else has uh, a gift that they have that you desire because it's so spectacular um, and you want to serve Yahweh that way. So you need to be faithful in what Yahweh entrusted to you, whether it's one talent, two talents, five talents, and you should walk only in that and do your best, and then you will fulfill the full purpose of representing this house of Yahweh as the body of the Messiah. So that concludes our study for tonight on the letter bet. Uh, is there any questions or comments? Um, hi, Philip. It's Sue here. Uh, um, what is the difference between the Aaronic priesthood and the Levitical priesthood? And the, well, we're not, oh, and the Melchizedek. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's a big question. Okay, so the Levitical priesthood, uh, the Levites, Levite means to interweave. So the Levites were not all priests, but all priests were Levites. Um, the Levites, some of the Levites only had once a year, they had to function within the temple. Other Levites served in the temple all the time, like the high priest. And um, so they need to... Uh, conduct themselves uh, uh, in, a, in a more holy level, so to speak. The other Levites lived among the nations, or the, the other camps, in order to help them um, with questions, supporting them and giving them wisdom, guiding them. They're like the, the shepherds, so to speak, where the priests, they facilitate the worship. So they had all these tasks and things to do, to facilitate all the, the sacrifices and do all of that. And then you had the people to set up the camp, break down the camp, move the camp. So everybody had a different function. Now, the order of Melchizedek, that is similar to the Levitical order, uh, uh, the Levitical priesthood order, and they fulfill the function of facilitating the worship. But it's in a different tabernacle setup. So we first had the tabernacle when they left Egypt. Then they built the temple, which is a, a, a physical building in, in the promised land. Then the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Now that temple is a tabernacle again, but it's multiple portable, movable tabernacles all over the world. And that's where we are now. And we will travel through the wilderness. And then when Mashiach comes again the second time, he will build his temple again, which is the new Jerusalem, which will be a fixed structure. So then we will not um, do all of that. So the Melchizedek priesthood is between the first coming and the second coming. 
and the Levitical priesthood is between uh, leaving Egypt and the first coming. It's just a, a, a different. And the one is facilitating first the tabernacle and then the fixed temple. And the second one is facilitating worship within a tabernacle mobile uh, setup. And in the New Jerusalem, if you read the prophets, the priesthood, and it's specifically called again Levitical priesthood, will come from the nations. So then the Levitical priesthood will be set up again because it's a fixed structure. I hope that answered the question. Okay. Um, just continuing on from that, when you said that the New Jerusalem will be built by us, is that because we are the living stones in the temple? Just, just repeat the question. Um, when you said that um, uh, the New Jerusalem will be built by us, um, does that mean that because we are living stones that we will be building the new Jerusalem, as in Ezekiel, his temple? Or, no, the uh, new Jerusalem, it says, behold the bride, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. So the new Jerusalem is the bride. So it consists of uh, people who are the ones who are in marriage covenant through Mashiach. And they will come down with the temple or with the New Jerusalem, but they're also representing the temple. So it's like a physical, spiritual, hybrid, paradoxical concept again. So we are the living stones that will make up the, the New Jerusalem, but Yahweh is the one who will basically put us together for that final construction that consists of us. So what that will look like, I don't know. Um, there's a description in Revelation, but it can be interpreted in a different way. It can maybe look totally different than what we think, uh, because it's a, a spiritual, physical, hybrid construction, so to speak. Shabbat shalom, Philip. shalom. Uh, thank you again for a. Uh, well, I, have to, I, need my, I need my glasses just a sec. <laughs> thank you once again for a um, beautiful study. And um, while I'm talking about the word beautiful, Genesis 15 1, that he is our exceedingly great reward. That is just such a beautiful, beautiful concept. And it just every time I read that, it just brings me to tears that he, uh, Yeshua, is our. Uh, and that's one of the most beautiful verses in all of scripture, but uh, he is one of our, uh, that he is our exceedingly great reward to uh, spend eternity uh, with him and uh, having Bible studies with him, I can't wait. Yeah, yeah. Um, regarding the uh, menorah pattern um, of the seven branch candlestick, the minimum would be three branches. Yeah. So do you think that would be uh, proof of the, um, the uh, Trinity, I hate using that word, but for want of a better word, uh, the uh, the Father and the Son and Ruach, um, because uh, three would three is the minimum, uh, three is the minimum for stability, three minimum uh, three branches, uh, yeah. for or, or or three poles if we're talking about the um, uh, tabernacle, but three is also uh, the most stable, like a, a triangle or a pyramid is a. Uh, is the most uh, stable uh, physical uh, structure, and I also heard a uh, also heard a minister saying that three is the minimum uh, number of uh, beings for uh, to express love. Because if you're by yourself, you can only love yourself. If you're with a couple, you can only love each other. But when you've got a third, you can uh, each each one can love two others. Yeah. So do you think the menorah? Uh, do you think the um, what you were saying before with the menorah pattern, do you think that could uh, be used, uh, well, uh, again, the minimum of three for stability? Do you think that could be uh, used as a, um, you know, because there are a lot of people that don't believe in the, in the Trinity or the God or the Godhead of, of Yeshua and uh, that the Holy Spirit isn't, isn't part of God. Do you think that could be um, useful in, in, in um, uh, describing uh, Elohim as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Quite interestingly, I've listened to a podcast earlier this week. Um, Mike Heiser um, discussed the concept of the Trinity, and he had a few fascinating things that he said. Um, that's why I, I made the comments of 
Yeshua is a lower manifestation of Yahweh. Um, for us to understand him, he said it's like a filter to protect us from the almighty God. That's like a consuming fire. And for us to have something to relate to, to, to understand him. So it's a lower representation for our comprehension, not lowering, lowering him in his stature, but only for our benefit. But he's still a manifestation of the Father. They're still connected. Um, and he also had a, had a mention of an angel that led Israel out of Egypt. And that's a verse there. And it said that the angel was Yahweh because he had the name of Yahweh in him. And he said that's another way to express um, Yeshua because he manifested Yahweh because his name is in him. If you look at the name Yeshua, that means Yahweh is my salvation. So Yahweh's name is in him. That's why he manifests Yahweh because of that. He points to Yahweh, connects to Yahweh, but for our benefit, he's slightly lower manifesting for our benefit to come and reach down to us. And the spirit is the same concept. It's, it's slightly different to the sun in order to reach down into our hearts, but they're all connected. They're not three different separate entities. They're one entity expressed in a different way, uh, so to speak. And they are one, and that's where that comes from. But they're definitely three as well, but in that context. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, regarding the uh, three uh, tabernacles or three parts of the tabernacle or, or three rooms or um, do you think that uh, links in with um, the transfiguration on the mount when um, Peter and I think it was Andrew were, were with uh, Yeshua when they went to the mountaintop and uh, Elijah and uh, Moses appeared and Peter in his uh, dumbness said, oh, Lord, you would you like us to build three booths for you? So do you think the three of them appearing on the uh, mountaintop there, uh, the transfiguration, do you think that links in with the uh, three rooms of the tabernacle as well? Yeah, I think the Yeshua was transfigured. So he represented the, 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 the manifestation of the Father. And then Moses and Elijah represented the two lower manifestations of, of the same. And the one was expressed through the, the written word, the commandments, which is Moses. The other one was uh, the revelation of the, the, the prophetic word, which is Elijah. And both are basically expressions of the word of Yahweh, which is Mashiach. Um, so they're basically manifestations of Mashiach um, linked to each other, and then Mashiach was manifested or glorified, which uh, is a manifestation of, of Yahweh in a, in a more realistic way uh, for the viewer when they, when they experience that. Yes. And uh, the uh, duality uh, paradox, or uh, another word I like to use is conundrum, uh, that is also expressed with the with good and evil, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that, uh, and and the spiritual and physical that, you know, uh, so many uh, detractors so, uh, and atheists say, oh, you know, so if God is a God of love and good, then why is it good and evil? And that's that's part of the freedom of choice and the duality there that. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, God being the source, uh, depending upon uh, how we exercise our free choice and what we what we choose, um, the uh, the duality of good and evil there is expressed. Isn't that yeah. amazing? Yeah. And the one thing they should not forget is the creation of darkness is to remove light. The creation of something that's cold is to remove heat. So when he removes something of himself, he actually creates the opposite of it. So the world of duality exist or consist of him and not him and the two extremes that exist within that so we can experience the coldness of of not having his presence or the warmth and the light of being in his presence and we've got the whole spectrum and now we can choose between the two so it's not to say he created evil he just removed himself and evil is because of his not him not being there uh, having been one who has uh, lived his life without his warmth, and then when you do feel his warmth, then the warmth becomes uh, like a fiery furnace, and you just be it becomes literally an, an addiction. You, and you, you just want more of it and more of it and more of it, and you want more of his love and more of his yeah. presence put into your existence, and it becomes 
you just crave it more and more and more and you want a deeper and deeper relationship with him. Um, the uh, spiritual realm, moving faster than the physical realm, you talked about um, 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 is expressed, uh, I've noticed, in uh, or explored in science fiction where often we get time travellers, instead of travelling back in time, they slow time down, they slow yes. their physical time down, which gives them an appear- the, uh, which gives the appearance to those who have been slowed down, the appearance that um, the other one is uh, travelling faster than light or travelling faster than time. I found that very interesting how you express it. That was amazing. Yeah, yeah. And, and that also uh, explains uh, a lot of how Yahweh could create a, a very complex entity or thing that will take a long time. Um, and it's in a short period of time from our point of view. Yes. Um, that's also expressed in Daniel. When Daniel was in prayer, um, Gabriel appeared to him to give him clarification on the vision. And Gabriel said that he was delayed because he was fighting the fighting the serpent. So some people say that uh, Gabriel, you know, travelled from one end of the universe to the other and was able to travel faster than time to get to um, Daniel in prayer. But when they exist, uh, function outside of time, they can just uh, quite easily step in and out of different time time periods. I think. Um, no, I think one, that that verse, if you if you think about it, was in our realm being delayed. Is for him coming from the spiritual into a lower realm and traveling through the realm of time to access the physical, and that's mm-hmm. when life took place. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one more thing: the uh, lameness or complete incompleteness you, you talked about. Um, that's also expressed by Adam when he noticed that uh, there wasn't a partner for him, and uh, it's almost like Yeshua uh, programmed or put that into Adam's DNA and into man's DNA to, to need a partner for to feel complete. But, um, yeah, so that was very interesting, wasn't it? Yeah, he will give us the desires of his heart. So his desire was to have someone to have a relationship with, and we received his desire as part of our DNA that's built into us because everything is holographic. Even the small thing contains the largest. Even his plan and his dreams are even embedded within us. Thanks. Any other comments or questions? That's it, Philip. There are no more questions. A general vote of thanks from the floor for uh, another good leadership of the study. And now there's a floor. <laughs> well, I'm glad you, you guys found it interesting and insightful. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed uh, the rest of your Shabbat and uh, may Yahweh bless you. Thank you, and, and our blessings upon your family and your work and your leadership. Well, thank you very much. I'll just end in prayer and then uh, uh, you can enjoy the rest of the Sabbath. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful uh, insight that you revealed to us through the Tibet to teach us a bit more about yourself and how wonderful you are and how awesome you are that we can't even comprehend and think about your greatness in a sense of who you really are. And thank you for giving us the concept of your son and your spirit to give us a a glimpse of your attributes. And thank you for your creation that give us a glimpse of who you are and the self-portrait you portray to every single thing you created. We just admire you, your creation, everything you've done. And we thank you that you place the same desires that's in you in us as well so we can grow up and become like you and be truly made in your image and your likeness. We just give you thanks and we, we, we bless you and we worship you in the mighty name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.